السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد وآله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما وفقها في الدين يا رب العالمين So alhamdulillah we're in the seventh session of the uh, history It's a brief history uh, Although we're going in a bit more detail than is normally covered uh, So just a quick recap of what we went through last week inshallah So we went through the 1948 war that took place after the declaration of the establishment of the State of Israel uh, by uh, Ben Guron in Tel Aviv on the 15th of May 1948 uh, thereafter the entrance of the Arab states uh, who came inside uh, and we talked about the uh, numbers we talked about the artillery the weapons that each side had etc the initial weapons the aircraft of Egypt uh, the areas where Egypt came in, so which is the area of Gaza, going up towards Tel Aviv, uh, and then from the east we have Jordan uh, with Iraqi troops, and then we had the Syrian troops and the Lebanese troops from the north, and they were all supposed to converge towards Tel Aviv. Um, thereafter, we discussed that uh, we covered that there was a ceasefire or a pause in the fighting for a short while and uh, the start of Operation Balak where they brought in fighter jets the IDF the, that was formed brought in fighter jets from Czechoslovakia the British um, former RAF pilot Gordon Levitt uh, and thereafter the weapons, the ammunition that came in etc all of that which built up there reserves also the uh, international uh, or the migration of uh, Jews, Zionists, Jews from different areas of the world coming in uh, and converging in uh, what was now a the declared state of Israel. Uh, and then we then the second phase of attacks, 8th of July to the 18th of July, 10 days, where the Israelis then went on the offensive, the Arabs on a defensive. There was a much change on the ground, a little bit in the south. Uh, thereafter, we covered from the 15th of October to the 10th of March of 1949, which is the end of the war, uh, in which the uh, IDF, which was now formed, had pushed back all of the uh, Egyptian forces, uh, had even at one point entered into the Sinai Desert, uh, in the north had pushed into Lebanon, taken over villages, and on, uh, towards the east they had pushed back the Jordanian-led forces to what is now the area which is um, the West Bank, and they had also entered into West Jerusalem. The East Jerusalem was still with the uh, Jordanian forces and the Palestinian forces. Uh, thereafter, we covered the different groups that formed eventually the Israeli army. So when they had, uh, when the war started, we had all these different uh, paramilitary groups and organizations, which then were then formed on the 29th of May into what was called, and what we now know as the IDF or the Israeli Defense Forces. Um, and they had foreign volunteers as well as, um, as part of their group and then on the other side we had what was known as the Arab Salvation Army uh, under the Arab League which consisted of a number of different countries Egypt, Transjordan, um, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon there were some troops from Saudi Arabia uh, a couple of a hundred from Yemen um, the Arab Liberation Army and then we had um, the Holy War Army which was led by a couple of Palestinians we covered them last week uh, and then we after us, we covered the total numbers. So we said the numbers varied, uh, but uh, initially 30,000, finally 120,000 on the uh, Israeli uh, side, and on the Arab side it was 13,000 uh, initially, uh, and then uh, approximated to be around uh, 55,000. However, the Israeli historian, Benny Morris, and I covered last week, he said that initially the uh, Israeli forces was 65,000 uh, so this is the Israeli historian and he said that at the end of the war they numbered 150,000 um, uh, whereas 
the Arab forces at the beginning of the war were only 28,000 so 28,000 versus 65,000 and by the end of the year, a war there were only 40,000 versus 150,000 Israeli troops this is according to the Israeli historian Benny Morris and by the end of the war the casualties were approximately 6,400 on the Israeli side and uh, the numbers vary but between 15,000 to 20,000 on the um, Arab side now the Arab side obviously includes Palestinians and non-Palestinians including the Egyptians, Jordanians, etc. Um, so if we were to cover the uh, Palestinians, uh, the Palestinians are estimated to be up to, up to 13,000. Up to 13 of the thousand of the casualties are estimated to be from the Palestinians. So approximately double the amount of uh, Israelis who were killed. And according to again the uh, uh, historians, um, majority of the Palestinians who were killed were non-combatants. Majority of the Palestinians who were killed were non-combatants. Uh, and then we just went over the political uh, events that took place at the time. So the declaration of the State of Israel, thereafter the start of the war, the UN then sending the uh, Count Falk uh, <laughs> Bernadette to um, investigate what's taking place, come up with a solution. He was appointed as the mediator. He, sets up, he publishes a report on the 16th of September, says that the Palestinians should have the right to return to their homes, and if they don't, they should be compensated in full. He is then declared a Nazi agent by the Stern Gang, and he is then assassinated the day after the, publishing the report, alongside his um, assistant, uh, a Frenchman named Surratt. Um, and we covered uh, what Ben Gurion said, that basically until the British left, the Arabs had not ent uh, or no Jewish settlement had ever been taken by the Arabs, however remote it was. But the Israeli forces or the Zionist forces had entered into many, uh, or the Hagana specifically, had entered into many Arab uh, villages and driven them out. So this was just on the political side, which had taken place at the same time. And now, if you remember this map, we covered uh, a couple of weeks ago when we discussed the uh, partition plan, 1947. And we said we'll come back to it because of the comparison between the plan and then what took place at the end of the armistice in 1949. So at the point of the armistice in 1949, you can see that the boundaries have changed. The boundaries have changed. So initially, the light blue, the light blue, that is what is the proposed UN partition plan for the Jewish state, the light blue. The rest of it basically is supposed to be an Arab state or Palestinian state with Jerusalem to be under UN control. So not by the Palestinians, nor by the uh, um, Jewish, Jewish uh, not, not under the Jewish state. Uh, after the 1948 war, which finished in March 1949, and in the agreements, various agreements that came into place, you had the UN Armistice Agreement. And these are the demarcation lines of 1949, and they are known as the Green Line. So whenever you hear behind the Green Line, etc., these are the lines that it means. What it means is uh, these the green areas. So this green area here, which is the Gaza Strip, and the green area here, which is the West Bank. And then uh, this area here, which is like a dark purple, pink, pinkish purple, that's East Jerusalem. East Jerusalem, and that is part of the Arab state. And then West Jerusalem, West Jerusalem is part of the uh, Jewish state, according to the demarcation lines of 1949. So as you can see, there's a vast difference in between the lines which were drawn, which is all this pink area, which was lost in uh, the armistice of 1949. So the boundaries have now changed so the consequence of 1948 or part of the 1948 war is what we know as the Nakba and Nakba in, is an Arabic word it means the catastrophe the catastrophe so just a few details first of all the numbers you will probably have heard of many times 750,000 plus Palestinians are displaced and uh, this is from the areas, so now the state of Israel and the Jewish state has taken over 79% of the land. 79% of the land. So only 21% remains with the Arabs. So it's a massive difference compared to what it was initially supposed to be. Um, so they left with a very small percent of the land. Thereafter we have 
uh, internally displaced, so they moved around with inside the, the lands which they are residing in. And then there are many hundreds of thousands who have then gone to reside in Jordan, gone to reside in Syria, in Lebanon, and uh, an amount also in Egypt. And then some went obviously to other countries, but mainly the surrounding countries at that time. And then we had the destruction of villages. So during this war, over 500 villages, Palestinian villages were completely destroyed. They ceased to exist. Uh, to the extent that the names were changed. The, the names were removed from the map. Some of the villages were changed into Jewish settlements and the names were changed into Hebrew names, uh, etc. So imagine five, oh, more than 500 villages are completely wiped off the map. Uh, then we have, uh, so the UN brought in a similar, brought in a number of resolutions following on from the war that took place in 1948. Without going into the details of the resolutions, part of it was, was uh, basically what was published in the report uh, by Falk Bernadette in um, 1948, in that the Palestinians have the right to return, so they should all be allowed to return to their homes, whether it be in the Arab state or the Jewish state, and if they, des if they of their own accord, say that we will not return, that they must be compensated for all of the losses that they have had from property and wealth. So this, is the, this was the resolution. To combat that resolution, the law, a law was brought in, which was the absentee law. So the absentee law said that it is, uh, the onus is on the Palestinians to prove that they are not absent at the time a Jew comes and occupies their property. That's the onus is on them. Now imagine you have 750,000 plus people driven out of their homes because uh, as we mentioned before, that when the Arabs were fighting against them, they did not drive the Jewish settlements away or away from their homes. But when they, in, during this war, the uh, IDF, they were pushing every single Arab Palestinian out of the area which was under their control as much as they could. Many of them ran away. Um, uh, scared of the uh, in, or to save their lives and protect themselves approximately 156,000 remained in what was the state of Israel out of over a million so uh, the law basically said that any immigrant Jew who is to come to the state of Israel he is able to take ownership of a home unless the Palestinian can prove that he was not absent at the time when the Jew came into the home. Now, obviously, this is basically impossible for him to prove, uh, and obviously, many of them are forced out of their homes. So that means all of these homes can be taken easily because they're not there because they've been driven out and are refugees due to the war. So this was a uh, and this uh, law was very detrimental to the Palestinians, uh, not allowing them to return. Then you have the law of return of 1950. So this law was enacted. Uh, again by the Israeli parliament and the law said that any Jew anywhere in the world has the right to return to his homeland because this is the homeland of the Jews therefore any Jew anywhere in the world has a right to return meaning has a right to reside and get uh, citizenship in the state of Israel and uh, this was also enacted in 1950 whereas the Palestinians were originally from the land they did not have the right to return back to the land which they were from so these two laws had a, amongst obviously a number of laws, but these two laws had the biggest uh, impact in terms of mass migration of Jews to Israel and also the uh, inability of Palestinians to return back to their homes. And as a result of this refugee crisis, because now you have hundreds of thousands of refugees, the United Nations uh, General Council created and uh, founded uh, the UNRWA organization which is specifically for Palestinian refugees which we hear every single day today in the news with the, re that, uh, the representative is on the ground they're saying that at the moment there's no real humanitarian assistance that's being able to give, being, be given in Gaza and uh, in terms of the Nakba although this was one event but uh, the historians and academics and scholars say that this Nakba is a continuous event that started even before 1948 even before 1948 because once we had the, the uh, international, the, we had the Jewish fund where they were purchasing homes this was driving out the Palestinians so this was the start of the catastrophe 
and then it came to its peak in 1948 when over 750,000 are driven out from their homes and displaced but then it continued because the raising of villages the removal of people from their homes destruction of their homes uh, displacement the killing of um, uh, Palestinians and the local populace continues and continued from them and continues until today so this is uh, is known as the ongoing Nakba thereafter after the war finishes we have 1949 to 1953 and during this period there are a number of uh, events that take place obviously at the end of the war the Palestinians are in a state of disarray uh, and uh, obviously they are at loss as to what they have lost etc so not much in terms of major events take place between this period uh, on a global scale however there are a number of important uh, events that took place so for example the martial law uh, the martial law was enacted uh, all the way from 1948 all the way till 1966 and this law impacted all of the Palestinians so there were approximately 156,000 as we said residing in what was now the state of Israel so these were the ones who had remained some of them were internally displaced they weren't in their original homes but they were still within the borders of the Jewish state they were under martial law what that meant was they were not allowed to leave their homes uh, they weren't allowed to go to another village without any permission so they had to basically we need visas to travel to other countries they needed a visa to go and visit their relatives in the next village and remember families had been split up some had gone there to take refuge some had gone there to take refuge to see their uh, own family members to see their own property they had to take permission they had to they had to apply for a permit and the permits were not easily just given you just go and sign a piece of paper no and so this was detrimental for the Palestinians who are actually residing within the borders of the Jewish state uh, thereafter we had geographical changes so just like all of those villages were wiped off the map um, destroyed displaced etc what we had was uh, the names were changed from Arab names to Jewish names new villages were brought about new settlements um, uh, kibbutz settlements were put in different places new settlements where no villages or no population had existed prior to that date and this is when when we look at the international maps that the name Palestine is removed from the map so if you look at many of the maps that we find from that time all the way until very recently there is no Palestine on the map you will find Israel but you won't find Palestine uh, and unfortunately you will find that even in like uh, the 1990s uh, maps that were coming uh, known as the map of the Muslim world etc we find that the area of Al-Quds it doesn't say Palestine it says Israel which is sad then we have um, the massacres continue to take place obviously we had the massacres that took place some cases up to 200 people being killed in a village sometimes 50 some it all varied they would go in a village sometimes small villages they would kill the people they continued through 1948 throughout the war 1949 1950 continued every single year from uh, these massacres one of the famous massacres is the massacre of Qibya so Qibya is a, vill a village on the border of Jordan and the West Bank West Bank and Jordan and this was in the fort on the 14th of October 19 uh, 1953 and this was a significant event that took place so Ariel Sharon and uh, his famous he was uh, he later on went on to become the Prime Minister of Israel uh, he was recommended by George Bush in 2002 uh, as a man of peace um, at that time he was known as one of the main generals of the uh, IDF he had taken part in the 1948 war he had established unit 101 which in his lifetime uh, carried out a number of raids on Palestinian villages uh, and a number of uh, people were killed uh, he then went on to play roles in uh, the six-day war he played role in the Lebanon war etc uh, so he has a list of wars in which he was he played a significant role Ariel Sharon uh, he died in 2014 after being in a vegetative state from 2006 
uh, for eight years after being in a coma, after suffering from a stroke. So, Ariel Sharon, he takes up to 700 troops. He takes up to 700 troops. And he goes to this village. He goes to this village. There's a gunfight with a few Palestinians who are on the border of the village, defending the village, maybe 10 or 12 of them. And then they go inside, they shoot at the homes, and they blow up uh, with dynamite 42 homes, a masjid and a school, a madrasa. They destroy all of these buildings. Up to 75 people, women and children in their own homes, by the doors of their homes, are killed. The UN inspectors, when they went later, and there are images from the massacre, they went later and they found bodies of women and children at the doors of their homes. At the doors of their homes. And so, uh, and, and this became an international phenomenon. There was condemnation from the United States, etc., to Israel. And we look at what the reaction of Israel was to these or the government was and Ben Gurion was. Now, first of all, what is the background to this event that took place? So what we have is we have, after the 1949 armistice line, the green line, uh, Palestinians are displaced all over the place, uh, different countries, some in Gaza, some in there. Well, now they're completely split up. The ones in Gaza can't go to West Bank. In the middle is the Jewish state. Uh, to, if they want to go another way, they have to go all the way through Egypt, to try to go through uh, the Red Sea, try to cross to Jordan. They, they can't go. So the only way they can go across land to West Bank or, is to go through Israel, cross the armistice line. So, and obviously a lot of them had homes, they had livestock, they had goods, uh, they had families, they had plantain, plantations, they had land. They had loads of property still back in the land which was now Jewish state. So what they did was they used to cross the borders. So they'd smuggle. Uh, their crops, sometimes they'd even sow in some of the land which had not yet been taken over by uh, any Jewish settlements. They'd grow crops, try and cultivate those crops, take them back, uh, sell them. There were clothes, for example, uh, Arab Bedouin clothes which were not available inside the Jewish state because they're Arab clothing, not Jewish clothing, um, or European clothing, which uh, many of the Jews were from Europe. And so they would smuggle these clothes in from the Gaza Strip, from Gaza inside, or from other areas. So this movement across the border was going on continuously. Obviously, from uh, uh, some of the myths is that they were coming trying to steal the crops of uh, those the, 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 from those who had uh, grown them in the Jewish settlements but these lands were belonging to these individuals in the first place uh, apart from that there were skirmishes as well but the skirmishes weren't to uh, such a high number so for example in three years from 1949 all the way to 1952 57 Israelis were killed in the skirmishes that took place, 57. In the following year, there was a slightly higher number, so 32 were killed in the, in the start of 1953, uh, taking the number up to um, 90, approximately 90 Israelis killed, so 89. In comparison, in comparison, the IDF was doing raids continuously, and not just within uh, Gaza and the West Bank. No, they were entering into Egypt, they were entering into Jordanian borders and they were carrying out raids in villages inside Jordan and inside uh, Egypt. Now compare the numbers, remember we said 57, going up to 89 in over a period of four years. In a period of three years, from 1950 to 1953, just on the Jordanian border, just on the Jordanian border, 629 Palestinians and Jordanians were, were killed or injured. So, the compare, compare the numbers. So, there were obviously skirmishes going back and forth. And uh, we had uh, the establishment of what was known as the Fidayin. Uh, and this was a word, literally it means those who sacrifice, self-sacrifices. That's what it means, literally. Uh, but this was a name that was given to those who were willing to sacrifice themselves for the, uh, for the state of Palestine, for the country of Palestine. Um, now this was generally these were uh, their goal of the Fidayin without there being a formal organization at this point uh, was the establishment of a secular democratic Palestinian state it was not an Islamic movement okay it was uh, the establishment of a secular democratic uh, Palestinian state, state that was the goal of the Fidayin and so they take um, uh, and so they are coming across, sometimes they are carrying out attacks. 
In one of the attacks that take, takes place just before this massacre, um, amongst others is, is that they came in, they threw a grenade, grenade into our home. And as a consequence of this, inside the home, there didn't happen to be any men, there happened to be a woman with two children. The woman's name was Suzanne, according to the reports. And the woman and the two children were killed. The woman and two children were killed. Now remember, the 629 have all, uh, Palestinians, men, women and children, have been killed and injured already. As compared to, inclu let's include the numbers of 1953, 89 Israelis, including this woman and her two children. So in response, what was happening was they had retaliations. They had retaliations. And what they would do is every time an attack would be carried out, they would retaliate with a ferocious response. With a ferocious response. So this uh, Qibya massacre was ordered by the Prime Minister and the Defence Minister. It was ordered by the Prime Minister himself in conjunction with the Defence Minister of the time. Uh, so Ben Gurion, he ordered Ayel Sharon and he said, kill and destroy as much as you can. And this is the exact command that Ayel Sharon gave to his unit, Unit 101 which he was one of the key members of uh, uh, establishing. So they go to the village. There are differences in numbers, but uh, most likely it was 650 to 700 troops under his command. They go at night, they surround the village, they kill the few uh, uh, guards, and they kill up to 75 people, women and children, people in their homes. Obviously, this had a massive impact internationally. It was, there was an outrage. Uh, how can you do such a thing? Now, let's see what the response was. What was the response of the Prime Minister of Israel? Now, internally, they had a discussion. What shall we do? How shall we respond? So they said, what we shall say is that it was not the army who carried out this attack. The army didn't do this, although it was the army. But they said it wasn't the army who did this. In fact, it was, uh, some, uh, it was civilian members of our society. Uh, who carried out this attack they had a discussion internally now uh, you will see as the statements we'll go through the statements that were made at the time so Ben Gurion previously one of the statements he made was this it doesn't matter what the international world says what's important is the message we give to our people internally and what they believe for the continuation of the establishment of the Jewish state and its expansion Okay, so that means it doesn't matter what the truth is. It doesn't matter what the truth is. It doesn't matter what the world may think or what other people will say. What's most important is that we give a message internally to our citizens, which will strengthen our state and enable us to expand. This is the key message that is given in all of the media uh, statements and media that comes out. And you can see a reflection until today and uh, understand the media narrative from this point of view. So, this is a statement that the Prime Minister, David ben Gurion gives on the 19th of October. So, a month later, after the outro, outro he says this. He says that none deplores it more than the government of Israel. That nobody can deplore it more if, if innocent blood was spilled. So, even though everyone knows that innocent blood is spilled, but he says if innocent blood has been spilled, nobody deplores it more than the Israeli government, even though he was the one who gave the command to do it. Okay. He says, the government of Israel rejects with all vigor the absurd and fantastic allegation that 600 men from, of the IDF took part in the action. When you know, afterwards it was proved that it was part of the IDF. We have carried out a searching investigation and it is clear beyond doubt that not a single army unit was, ab uh, was absent from its base on the night of the attack on Qibya. Now, if you look at this statement, uh, and then we can look at the statements that come out today as well. So, complete denial of what took place. So, what actually happened? So, the same day he goes on uh, the radio, Israeli radio, and he says this. Basically, to summarize this statement, this is word to word his statement, uh, but to summarize his statement, he gives a background. He says that... Uh, the Jewish settlers in Israel, the mostly refugees, uh, they came um, from other Arab countries where they were persecuted and they came from the concentration camps of the Nazis and they settled in this area and they faced continuous attacks uh, from murderous attacks from the Arabs and the Palestinians and they showed great restraint 
um, and they didn't do anything but they had the rightful demand that the government should protect their lives and they took up weapons to defend themselves and uh, they trained and the Israeli government gave them these weapons so that they could protect themselves they're not part of the army uh, they were trained on self-defense and how to use these weapons um, but these forces from Transjordan uh, they didn't stop in their criminal attacks and they kept coming across the border and killing these poor um, uh, refugees uh, who were living there and so some of these border settlements on the border of Transjordan they lost their patients and they did a retaliation uh, last week across, uh, across the border uh, which was one of the main centers of those who were attacking them and these murderous gangs and every one of us regrets and uh, suffers when blood is shed anywhere and nobody regrets more than the Israeli government that in, innocent people are killed and uh, so on but he, eventually he goes on to say but the responsibility does not lie with us nor does it lie with them the responsibility lies with the Transjordan trans -Jord uh, Jordan government that has for many years tolerated and encouraged these Fidayi and these murderous gangs to cross the border and kill our citizens and terrorize them so this is the narrative that was given regarding this incident um, but the mindset that they had was this this was a mindset that they had and this is a statement by defense minister Moshe Dayan he became defense minister he again was a general of the army in 1948 um, he also fought in the six day war he, he fought in uh, Lebanon etc so he played a, played a major role he fought in the second world war where he lost uh, an eye uh, fighting for the British uh, so the statement he made was that we are not in retaliation for any attacks that's taken place where one citizen may be injured or killed or wounded or whatever this was the policy and this was the mindset we are not able to protect every man so we can't protect every single uh, member of our state but we can prove that the price for blue Jewish blood is high we can prove that the price for Jewish blood is high so if you kill 1,200 we will kill 20,000 as in Gaza today the same mindset so this was the mindset then one woman and two children were killed they destroyed the whole village and killed 75 and this was the um, same mindset that they had in every single one of these attacks that were taking place at the time they were known as the retaliatory attacks against what they called uh, murderous gangs Following on from this, we had a major event which took place, which was the Leven Affair. So this took place in uh, 1954. So just before this, uh, we need a bit of a background of uh, why this was taking place. Now, if you remember, we have the Fidayin, uh, who are known as the Fidayin, these um, freedom fighters, or whatever, however they may be translated in English. Um, as we said, they were looking; for, they were nationalists. Uh, they were looking for a secular democratic state and as we mentioned last week and the week before that a lot of the issues and problems uh, that were there at that time and exist until today was the issue of nationalism the Egyptians cared more about Egypt than anything else the government of Egypt cared more about Egypt than anything else uh, same as Transjordan, same as uh, the Saudi Arabian state, same as Iraq, uh, Lebanon, Syria they were self-preserving the state of their, their own countries, their own borders. Uh, and this seed of nationalism had been sown at the time of divide and conquer by the British occupation uh, to split up the Ottoman Empire, the seeds of Arab nationalism, and then after each of these states. So this nationalistic, um, uh, uh, let's say, vigor had continued. And this was a, or the main motivation for the 1948 war the, nas the, the nationalism this is an Arab state this is, belongs to Palestinians this belongs to Egyptians this belongs to the Jordanians this belongs to Syrians this belongs to the Lebanese so there was a big issue of uh, or, or the motivation was nationalism it was not uh, necessarily an Islamic issue it was not necessarily an Islamic issue and as we can see the, uh, when we read the history regarding the leaders of these states at the time they, had, they were very dis dis di uh, distant from Islam they were very distant from Islam in all of these Arab states so in uh, Egypt it was occupied by the British 
if we remember and British Britain had uh, there was a king in Egypt and Britain had bases they had police they had and they had military police and they had military outposts in Egypt um, and whenever they found that uh, there's a certain minister who's uh, not in line with British interests they would force the government to change the minister at one at one point they surrounded the king's palace uh, the leader of Egypt was a, the king was at the age of he's around 22 years old at the time. They surrounded the palace with tanks and troops, and they said you must fire the defense minister and replace him with somebody else, or the justice minister replace him with somebody else. So this was the impact that the British troops in Egypt had on the rule in Egypt. Direct interference with the government, and they did this multiple times. They would make sure that the government puts in only those ministers who are in favor of the British. Obviously, because of the nationalism, there was a fear amongst the people that we don't want this British foreign influence in our affairs. From amongst those people was an individual named Abdul Jamal, uh, Jamal Abdul Nasser. Jamal Abdul Nasser. Uh, he, he first he initially went to school, he went to college, he went to university, and eventually he went through the military academy. Uh, he joined the military, the Egyptian military. Uh, and he formed a group who were known as the Free Officers. And this was a secret group which he established with the hope that, um, uh, first of all, we as Egypt... So his father was again nationalistic. He wanted... He was a nationalist. He wanted Egypt for Egyptians. He didn't want foreigners inside. Um, was he against British control? Now, the outward appearance is that he was against foreign control. He was against British control. However, there are documented um, uh, meetings between him and the British, sort of agreements that are made between him and the British behind closed doors with regards to what's taking place. Um, some historians are of the opinion that uh, the coup that was taking place uh, and the coming of Jamal Abdel Nasser was not actually a, um, a reason for, uh, was not actually completely in uh, dis disregard to the British or without any involvement of the British but rather as has been proven Jamal Abdel Nasser had informed the British with regards to and the, and the US with regards to his plan of staging the coup and overthrowing the government so he throws a, a coup without going into all of the details but the coup takes place in 1952 so just a couple of years before this and what Jamal Abdel Nasser does is he gets all those forces who are against the status quo, who are against the status quo. So he brings in the young Arab revolutionists, um, uh, Egyptian groups, etc. His free officers are leading. Uh, and he also allies with the Islamic groups, who at that time were the Muslim Brotherhood. And they were uh, campaigning for um, uh, an Islamic um, change in Egypt, uh, because Egypt had become very secular and, and um, uh, Islamic uh, rituals are frowned upon in society and so he allied with all of them in his coup which he uh, enacted in 1952 and so he comes to power when he comes to power uh, you have uh, an agreement between him and the British and the agreement was uh, that the British agreed that they will stop patrolling the Suez Canal They'll stop patrolling the Suez Canal. Because remember at that time, the Suez Canal was uh, in ownership 50% of the British and Egyptian. Uh, but they said, no, this is Egyptian. So they said, okay, the British agreed that they will stop patrolling in the Suez Canal. Now, at this point, at this point in time, the Ben-Gurion had stepped down for Moshe Sharet to become the Prime Minister of Israel. But he only remained the Prime Minister of, for two years because of this event that took place. So he was Prime Minister from 1954 January till November 1955. So the fear was, what the Israeli state was scared was that if the British withdraw from Egypt, or they withdraw specifically from monitoring the Suez Canal, and there's no British warships there, the fear is that that might give an incentive to the Egyptians to enter into Sinai desert, completely occupy the Sinai desert and bring their troops all the way up to the border of Israel and maybe enter into Israel. And so they decided that they will do a, um, a plan in order to get rid of Jamal Abdel Nasser and have the British in their favor. 
and the Americans in their favor. So Jamal Abdul Nasser, just understand the picture again. Jamal Abdul Nasser is a nationalist. Uh, he wants uh, there's a common uh, feeling amongst the Egyptians that they want independence from British occupation and direct involvement in their affairs and American influence. Uh, Jamal Abdul Nasser then does a coup. He comes into power, but he informs the British and the Americans that he's going to do this. Don't stand in my way, and we'll make agreements. He comes into power. He makes an agreement with the British that they will withdraw from the uh, uh, Suez Canal. Uh, but they are still in Egypt at this point. The Israelis are now scared. So what they do is they then make uh, a plan under the command of Moshe Sharet and Mossad. That, uh, and they name the plan Operation Susanna. They name the plan Operation Susanna. What is the plan? The plan is that they will get Egyptian Zionist Jews. So Zionist Jews who are living in Egypt and uh, what they will do is they will be trained and they will bomb US, uh, US and British interests, so American and British interests in, uh, in Egypt. So they will bomb, bomb the US Embassy, the British Embassy and places and hotels which are um, uh, visited by Westerners. But, and they will make it look like it's carried out by the Islamic, by the Muslim Brotherhood, by the Ikhwan al Muslimin. So the blame will come on the Muslim Brotherhood. And remember, Jamal Abdul Nasser, when he came to power, he allied with the Muslim Brotherhood in order to uh, get support in him coming into power. Uh, although he gave them two basically uh, non important uh, roles, ministerial roles in government, he gave two individuals from the Muslim Brotherhood uh, two roles in the government in order that they may be happy that they are involved but don't really have any say. Uh, so he had sidelined them by that time anyway. But what the Egyptians, what the Israelis wanted was they wanted Britain to stop working and supporting Jabal Abdul Nasser because they feared for themselves. So they're going to blame it on the Islamic fundamentalist groups, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, and that will then, and then they will say that Jamal Abdul Nasser and his government are giving a safe haven to these fundamentalist groups. Therefore, Britain and America, you can't work with him. Change him and bring somebody else. However, uh, rather than proving that he was harboring them, what happened was that these individuals were caught before they were able to carry out the plan and the attack. So they were caught and uh, everything came to light. But again, as was the habit of the ministers, they denied that this plan was there. Although a number of years later, in 1960, they admitted to everything. But um, at the time, they again denied, they said, no, 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 this has got nothing to do, this has nothing to do with us. We have not planned such an attack and Operation Susanna, we don't know anything about it. So this was the plan that they did. And this was known as the uh, Levan Affair. And uh, this was, well, eventually this was the cause of uh, Moshe Sharat to uh, resign and Ben Gurion came back and became the Prime Minister again. Um, that did not stop them though. So in 1955, on the 28th of February, they did an operation, the Bla Operation Black Arrow. And they entered into Gaza. And when they entered into Gaza, they killed 40 Egyptians and 30 Palestinians. They came inside, they called it Operation Black Arrow, they went in, they killed 40 Egyptians, 30 Palestinians, and then came out again. So again, they carried on with their attacks and their uh, massacres. One point which I forgot to note uh, with regards to uh, what took place after the massacre of Ariel Sharon in Qibya uh, was that there was a, a, an under-the-table agreement between King Abdullah of Jordan and the uh, leaders of the Zionist state, the leaders of Israel. And uh, during this whole time, when the Palestinians were crossing borders, etc., uh, uh, Jordan had put soldiers and put guards on the border to stop them crossing, to stop them crossing. Up to one point before this uh, incident, approximately 50% of prisoners in Jordan prisons, or that are Transjordanian prisons, were Palestinians who had been accused of theft and crossing the border. Okay, 
after this uh, Qibya massacre, one of the impact ones that they put even more pressure on the government of Jordan and again they had a discussion and they were under the table agreements and Jordan arrested immediately following on from this uh, from this massacre they immediately arrested over 1,000 uh, of these freedom fighters the Fida'i and they continued to do so and they put more troops on the border which uh, basically very minimized minimized greatly the uh, cross borders uh, travel of Palestinians and again this goes back to the point of nationalism which we made earlier it was a preservation of Transjordan it doesn't matter really what the impact may be on the Palestinians so uh, coming back to this so in Operation Black Arrow they destroyed a railway station they killed uh, 40 Egyptians 30 Palestinians and then came back so their massacres continued Um, and w today we'll stop at this point because what happens next is the war, uh, sorry, is the Suez Canal crisis, and thereafter the uh, war that takes place uh, after that. That, inshallah, we'll cover in detail uh, next week. But as we can see this week, the events continued even after 1948. Massacres continued, cross borders. Palestinians are continuing to be to be killed, uh, even though it's not an active war. Uh, and then we have these international. Uh, political dilemmas which are having an impact on uh, the situation in the land of Palestine and uh, those who are living there and who are living as refugees in the countries surrounding uh, Palestine in Jordan and in Egypt and the story of Jamal Abdel Nasser doesn't end here it continues with the Suez Canal crisis and thereafter uh, with the war inshallah we'll cover that uh, next week before we finish if there are any uh, questions with regards to what we have uh, covered today. Um, how much, uh, you mentioned persecution against Jews. Uh, how much of that is actually like after after World War Two? I guess. I mean, how much was there of that? Was there a lot of migration into Israel because of that? Okay. So with regards to the. Um, uh, so, so in one of the statements that was made by Ben Gurion, he mentioned the persecution of Jews in Arab states. So until the establishment of the State of Israel, the Jews in the Arab states were living a um, they were living they were living a um, a peaceful uh, life. Nobody was interfering. They weren't being attacked, etc. But uh, after the establishment of the State of Israel, obviously the war starts, etc., and uh, they. They lose the the Arab states have lost the war, basically, and Palestine has uh, and the Jewish the state has been established. Uh, it's called the State of Israel, and they're all living um, peacefully. So what they do is they uh, then call uh, Jews to come to Palestine, to Israel, to their state, to the new established state from all parts of the, around the world. So we have hundreds of thousands coming from like hundred thousand come from Poland, hundred thousand come from Romania. All different countries, they're coming in from Eastern Europe, Western Europe, over 225,000 Jews come. Uh, in this period that we have from 1948, uh, 1949, uh, all the way up to um, 1954, 1956, we have almost a million Jews, almost a million Jews coming into the city. The population doubled in this period. The population doubled. So there were a number of factors. Number one was obviously because of the, what was taking place in Palestine, uh, a fervor of anti um, uh, or dislike of Jews, etc., started uh, coming in Arab societies because they were seen as part of the those who had caused the problem in uh, Palestine. Although it wasn't really um, uh, to the extent where they were completely driven out from their homes or killed, whatever. But they faced a uh, backlash. Obviously, they faced backlash. Sometimes from the government, sometimes from individuals. Uh, in Transjordan, it was mainly a few individuals. Uh, in Egypt, there was some government um, pressure occasionally that was put uh, on on the Jews who were living in Egypt. As we said, there were Zionist Jews also residing in these countries. And after the establishment of the State of Israel, a large number of Jews became Zionists. Just like after the Balfour Declaration, it increased the number of Zionists. When the actual state was declared and then they won the war, this converted many of the Jews around the world into 
to uh, the idea of Zionism and the establishment of the uh, of the state, and they all came into Israel. So that's why a lot of them then uh, came from all of these around. Probably the highest number of Jews probably came from Iraq. They came from Iraq into uh, uh, into the newly established state of Israel. I hope that answers the question. Any other questions? So uh, Jamal Abdel Nasser, after the coup, initially he put somebody else in charge um, to be the face because he was a young, young uh, colonel in the army. He wasn't uh, a senior political leader. So he didn't become the leader first, but then there was a... Um, uh, they ended up being a disagreement between him and who had been appointed as the leader and so eventually he became the, he became the leader afterwards. The, the plan or the stated plan of the free officers in Jamal Abdel Nasser was to establish a true secular free democracy in Egypt. And it was Jamal Abdel Nasser, uh, initially he, uh, as I said, he made allies with the Muslim Brotherhood and other groups, etc. But it was Jamal Abdel Nasser who then cracked down on the Muslim Brotherhood and uh, put, sentenced many of them to death and imprisoned uh, thousands of them and, and, and tortured them. Uh, and completely banned them in Egypt uh, a few years later whilst he was in power. Any other questions? Um, did people leave Palestine in around the Nagba time because they were called by the Sarni Arab states? Did the Sarni Arab states offer them sanctuary? Okay. Or, uh, you know, there's a lot of, hmm. lot of you know, theories here from Zionists is that there was no Nagba. Actually, people left because they were offered protection yeah. by the so uh, uh, good question there's a there's a it, it's a myth this this point is a myth so the zionist um, statements from the time the leaders and continuously until today the narrative is that the palestinians left of their own accord and the palestinians uh, leaders were telling the palestinians to leave and go to Jordan or go to Syria or go to Lebanon uh, and, and leave the area of the Jewish state, leave it for the Jews. This is what is um, uh, put forward. However, the reality is that no documentation has been found until today of any newspaper broadcast, any uh, radio broadcast or anything telling Palestinians to leave their homes and go to uh, Jordan or go to Syria or go to Lebanon or go anywhere else. There's no record, not a single radio broadcast, not a single print in the newspaper, nothing. There's no evidence at all for this claim that uh, they were told by their leaders. There's not a single statement that can be found. So w the reason why they left was because they were forced out of their homes. Uh, some of them were physically, literally forced with the army coming on their doorstep and others just ran for their lives to, because they were fearing that the army is coming in the next village, they're going to come here next and destroy us and kill us. Men, women and children, as you can see, they want uh, discriminating. So obviously they're not going to be killed when they go to Jordan or they go to Syria or they go to Lebanon, so it's a safe place. But they're refugees. Um, it wasn't that they left of their own accord. If it had been left to them, they, I mean, it's common sense, they wouldn't have gone anywhere. So it's a myth that they were told by their leaders and they left of their own accord. Any other questions? No, khair, inshallah. Sorry. No, so we, we mentioned that... Of, yes, no, no worries. So we mentioned last week, uh, obviously we had the British mandate in Palestine. Yeah? So the, Pal the Palestinians didn't have their own army The Israelis, um, the Zionist uh, federations They had established their own paramilitary units Joined with Britain in World War II, etc So they had trained uh, personnel um, uh, And they had taken part in different countries as well In, in, in World War II the, And they had made Haganah and other groups Paramilitary groups The Palestinians didn't really have anything um, Because uh, it was British Mandate of Palestine. The British Army was basically the army there, 
uh, they were subdued by the British many times, so many of them killed, the weapons were taken, we mentioned once, uh, tens of thousands of weapons were taken from Palestinians, uh, whereas only a couple of hundred were taken from the, the, the Jews of the time. So basically the, the, the Palestinians were killed, oppressed, uh, stripped of all their weapons before the war took place. They didn't have a regular army because they weren't allowed to have one uh, because of the British rule in Palestine. Um, they had what we mentioned uh, last week, Hassan al salama and, um, and a couple of others who recruited like locals. Uh, they had support, but they weren't really armed in a sense. So uh, we mentioned last week that their numbers went up to like 50,000, maybe even a, even a bit more. But they were all supporters, they weren't armed. Maybe about 5,000 of them were armed. So they didn't really have an army because uh, it wasn't exactly an established place and after just the consequences of events. Uh, the Arab states around obviously they were established states with rulers, so they had their own armies. But the local Palestinians at that point, they didn't have their own army now. So, uh, intentions can be discussed, can be uh, debated, uh, but the facts are there, you can interpret the facts as you want. Yeah? Uh, one side are trained, um, given weapons, etc. But you, you have to remember that the um, Palestinians were a threat to British rule. Okay? The Palestinians are a threat to British rule. Why? Because the British are occupying Palestine. The British are occupying Palestine. So there were, uh, as we mentioned, uprisings against the British. So it was in British interests not to arm the Palestinians, to suppress them, not to train them militarily, because if they did, then they would be in danger. Uh, because then they can turn back and uh, drive them out. But it's in their interest to train the um, incoming uh, refugees or migrants, the Jewish the part of the Zionists, because... Uh, number one, they'll assist them in uh, quashing the Palestinian resistance uh, and uh, basically sway the balance of power. So it's uh, it's in their own interest. I think the thing was that the Rothschilds were very close to the royal family as well. And the Rothschilds did a back deal with the British. Yeah, so we, we covered the Rothschilds uh, previously from 1910s. Uh, from uh, obviously the, the Balfour Declaration was the letter given to the Rothschilds. Uh, obviously, that's there as well. But the agreements between the British and the uh, Zionist Feder World Zionist Fer Federation was there from uh, from before. But they were on the same side in World War One, and again the same side in World War Two. Um, yeah. Uh, in no, so um, so <laughs> uh, so in terms of support, they had support from the U.S. because they had a massive uh, lobby. Remember the weapons we discussed last week. The weapons were coming from the U.S. They were still getting uh, support from the U.S. So the U.S. had sold them submarine. Um, they had sold them. Uh, out of use military warships initially then afterwards they were given uh, not the way now sending off uh, shiploads or, or um, um, aircraft carriers full of weapons but uh, generally the support was there because as we mentioned the, the Zionist lobby was very strong in the United States they held uh, senior positions including our advisor to the president uh, so generally they were, they were so they were basically pro pro Israel uh, as were the British and we'll see uh, what happens next in the Suez Canal crisis, the support of uh, Britain, uh, etc., for and the U.S. for Israel, uh, and how they came in uh, as part of the Suez Canal crisis. So it's a good question because it follows on from what we're going to start next week, inshallah. Right. Any other questions? No. Okay. Khair, inshallah. We ask that Allah Azza wa Jal enable us to take lessons from these events and understand. Uh, what really took place and we ask that Allah Azza wa Jal uh, grant freedom and liberation uh, and peace and tranquility uh, to our brothers and sisters 
in Gaza and Palestine and we ask that Allah Azza wa Jal returns al Masjid al-Aqsa um, and its freedom and peace to the whole Muslim Ummah. Ameen. Wa akhiru da'wan. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.